So this is a modified slide it's like I gave at the, uh, the float conference last year, talking about the microbiology project. But before we get underway, I wanna share some good news because it's about time that all of us have a little bit of good news. And believe it or not, we are either at or just beyond the latest peak of COVID-19. Depends on where you are, what part of the United States or what part of Canada you're in. But the latest data is showing that we're on a distinct trend line in North America headed down. So following the trend, I think most of us, if you can see my cursor, we're right up in here today. I think we're going to be back down about this level within four weeks, back to where we were long about mid-November. It's not gonna be our last surge of COVID, but from here on out, most of our outbreaks of uh, uh, COVID are probably gonna be gentler. And the unfortunate news, if you haven't already had COVID, you're likely to get it in the next four weeks because most everybody's gonna get it. And personally, I can tell you, I had it in January of 20 when it first came out, got it in September, got Delta, and I just got over Omicron. And I'm fully vaccinated and boosted. So it's just like, uh, I never got sick maybe one day I was kind of laying there hoping that the batteries in the remote for the TV didn't die. But that was about as sick as I got. And I was able to get up and change the batteries. So I wasn't really that sick. Okay. All right. Now, everybody, we need to get back into doing some serious business. So we're gonna start off with some serious monkey business. There's gonna be a 10 question test to see how knowledgeable you really are. Now you've got about 10 seconds for each question. There's gonna be four questions in biology, three in chemistry and three in food science. There will be rewards for the high scores. Mm -hmm. So pay attention. Ready? Here we go. Biology. Name five types of flying animals. Time's up. What I got are birds, insects, bats, squirrels, fish, spiders, and did anybody remember to get humans? Because we have these things called airplanes. I did not specify how you had to fly. Okay. You notice I get to write the rules. So it's like, so it's my test. Okay. Question number two, why can't you kill viruses? You got an answer? They're not alive. Biologists don't consider viruses alive. So you can't kill something that's not alive. All right, you, I'm putting you on the honor system. You realize that it's like you're getting to uh, keep track of your own scores here. I mean, so I'm not requiring you to turn in a grade sheet to get this prize, you know? So just be honest about these things. How many kinds of North American mammals lay eggs. I'm talking physical leg eggs, not 
humor eggs in a stand-up routine like I'm trying to do right now here, okay? How many types of North American mammals lay eggs? Zero. The duckbill platypus and four kinds of echidnas are only in Australia and New Guinea. Question number four. When did dinosaurs go extinct? Drew wants this question. He wants this question. Two answers. <laughs> Give me an answer, Drew. Come on. I was going to say trick question. They never existed. But I have. I, it was just. Well, a that's one. That's a one potential answer. But I'm going to disagree with that one. The two answers that I've got are either 65 million years ago, or they didn't, because birds. Some people consider birds dinosaurs. Full credit for either one. Chemistry. What is another name for dihydrogen monoxide? Now, some of you geeks might know this one. Come on. This is a classic chemistry stupid question. Water. Two hydrogens, one oxygen. Why is, now this is for you that live north up there where you get that white stuff on the ground. I think you call it snow. Why do you use calcium chloride on sidewalks? It has a lower freezing point than salt. So if you've got calcium chloride, you put it on your sidewalk and the water won't freeze until it's down to about 21 or so, and salt will freeze at about 25. What is the chemical symbol for plutonium? Now, this one, if you've got kids, particularly little kids running around, you might have an Einstein genius running around. Because if the kid is running around going, P-U, P-U, he's actually talking about plutonium. Yeah, I know, James, you love that one. Uh-huh, you want to go off mute. Food science. Which has more live bacteria? Canned or fresh sauerkraut? Now, this is one that we should give Jocelyn, you know, but unfortunately, Jocelyn already know the answer, so it would be a freebie for her. All right. So which one has more bacteria? Because you eat sauerkraut, not only for the flavor, but for the health benefits. Fresh, because canned has been pasteurized, just like canned beer. What's the difference between pulque and tequila? Ah, I see I got a few faces in here that are puzzled by that one. Pulque is the wine made from the agave plant that you distill to make the tequila. See, there was an alcohol question related in there somewhere, wasn't there? So what's the difference between green and black tea? Black tea has fermented leaves. Green tea uses non-fermented leaves. Okay. All right, if you got seven or more, give yourself a big pat on the back. Now, I never promised you that the reward was going to be worth anything at all. So the reward you got was 
the fact that you beat the heck out of the other people on the flow con on the on a conference call right now. So, all right. But this is an illustration. I mean, it's like, yeah, there are a whole bunch of series of stupid questions that I came out of the blue one. And believe me, I've got a lot more I could have put on here. But probably nobody could have answered all the questions unless you had some really warped mind like I've got on here. And even a couple of them, I verified like exactly where the egg laying monotremes were. I forgot that they were uh, outside of Australia as well. But if we pool our collective knowledge, we, can, we could have answered all these questions. And that's really what we're talking about, putting our knowledge together and, and sharing some information on here. And that's why we're here, is to talk about being able to share some information going forward. All right, first question, and this is a serious question for once, I'll put it that way. It's like, how many people get sick from floating in a float tank? We don't actually know. Now we think it's very, very safe from a microbial viewpoint, but we don't have any comprehensive data on that. And in the public health venue, they looking around and saying, well, if we don't have any data, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at something that's similar and it's gonna be pools and spas. And we're gonna take all the data from pools and spas and we're gonna apply it over here. And it's all the rules and regulations and pools and spas are gonna be put over here. And then the regulations that don't even really apply, we're stuck with. And so this is the kind of mindset many of you have had to face with and a lot of areas that are still growing are facing that same issue right now so without data a default position for public health is always going to be ban everything regulate the hell out of it and require an awful lot of work that's probably not required now the kind of data that they get and looking at pools and spas, this is from the Centers for Disease Control. This is the summary of recreation water illnesses that from 2015 to 2019. This publication came out, I think it was last May. And you know, what do all the bars mean? It's like, well, the, the big dark one is cryptosporidium, which causes massive cases of diarrhea. Legionella is the slightly darker, uh, slightly less blue ones. That kills about 10 or 15 people per year. And this other bar in here is all of the other microbes. And what then we look at when we look at pools and spa data, it's like these are the same kind of germs that a public health official looks at and is trying to regulate float tanks and saying, we have to control these. Well, when we're thinking about that, it's like we need to ask questions. Is the water the same? Well, we don't really have water. We have a salt solution that weighs like a ton if you pick up a quart bottle of it. Are the users the same? Well, how many times in a float tank do we have a birthday party of 15, 12 year olds that are in the float tank for five hours on a Saturday afternoon? As far as that matter goes, how many people go swimming laps in a float tank or sit there and turn the jets on like in a spa and sit in the float tank and drink two six packs of beer? Okay, and then is the disinfection system the same? Is the filtration system the same? So when we start thinking about float tanks, we know there are differences, but health departments do not necessarily understand that. That's why you get so many questions sometimes about, you mean you don't want to run the filters when somebody is in the float tank? 
are you crazy? We have to have the filter running because their mindset is on pools and spots. And if we don't have good data, this is where we're headed. All right. So a way to think about risk management. And risk is a combination of something that's dangerous, like a hazard. And are you exposed to it? Does it happen? And then how you respond to it. So the hazard's the germ. The exposure is, do you swallow it? Do you get your skin wet? Do you inhale it? That's the exposure patterns we're talking about. And dose response is actually how our human bodies respond to it. And to a large extent, we could describe this same pattern for talking about COVID-19. The hazard is the virus, exposure is in the air, and the dose response is how your body reacts to it. And if we eliminate either the hazard by disinfection or taking a shower beforehand, for instance, or if we're not exposed to it, we can make the hazard or exposure go to zero. And since these are multiplied together, if you've got one zero in this equation, you've got no risk. So we go through and we look at how we can control these things. And back about four years, back about three and a half years ago, uh, at the 2018 float conference, I did a risk assessment. And uh, we'll get the full slides of that posted up here on the FTA website here within the next week or two on here. Frankly, I went through and did a pretty detailed risk assessment, knowing about every kind of type of germ that we think there is. I can't find a germ that I think poses a reasonable high risk in a float tank. In other words, I think the way we're running them by maintaining our salt levels, by not running the filter when we have somebody in the tank, I think we have a very safe environment from a microbial standpoint. And after I presented it at the float conference in August, uh, Ashcon and I presented it at the World Aquatic Health Conference uh, following, uh, I think it was October, uh, uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. We had about 100 health officials there, including from the members of the CDC. All the health officials there went through the risk assessment with me. They all agreed that this is what a reasonable thing, but simply doing a paperwork exercise like this is not enough to convince all the health officials. So that's why we're still facing some resistance with health officials. So we need to now go back and verify some of this information. And why are they gonna be suspicious? Well, they're gonna consider me an insider. Even though I do not run a float center, they're gonna consider me an industry person. And health officials have a very cautious view about anything coming from an industry profession. And even though we've got a good mathematical model, we don't have, good solid data on number of illnesses. So it's like, we're battling an uphill battle. All right, health departments are not gonna go out and do the kind of study that, they, that needs to be done. They don't have the resources, they don't have the time, they don't have the desire because they've only got one or two or three float centers in their area. And this is a national and international business. So it's the collective effort of the industry that we need to focus on. So the default position with no data, with no studies, they're gonna go back to where they were before I presented the risk assessment. Therefore, we need to develop reliable data on microbiology of float tanks. All right, let's make sure we got some right correct terms. There are specific terms that mean specific things. Uh, biology is actually a vocabulary science. The terms are very closely defined and you need to use the terms properly. And 
this is a series of terms on here. And uh, when we get the slides posted, you can have all this, but it's like coliform is a type of bacteria, but a fecal coliform is a special kind of bacteria on here. And you see these terms CFU, colony forming units, that's our own kind of terminology in here. And if you're in United States or Canada or Mexico, the word disinfectant means one thing. It means something entirely different if you're not inside of the Americas. So how we define terms when we're talking about this, we need to be very careful. All right, if we're going to, if we want to test our microbiology, and if we want to have a collaborative effort, the idea is that a number of you have already volunteered to share information that you're doing or planning on doing in the future. How would we go about developing data? The first thing we need to do is realize that we want quality data. So we don't want to go to some fly-by-night place, and, you know, I don't know, run by somebody named James in Portland or Roy in Georgia. Or, no, we want to go to a qualified I, uh, I, You turned your camera off. I had to make sure that you were still alive, James. I mean, it was like, come on. All right. So what we want to do is if we're doing, if we're going to go to the effort, to test our water, whether we have to test it or whether we want to test it just to make sure we're safe. We want to select a quality laboratory. And uh, sorry for you guys in Montreal, I'll, I'll see if I can do some digging, but I think you've got some labs up there. This is primarily a US initiative on how you do the testing. So uh, uh, Vincent Bernard up there, I'll get you some additional information on, on laboratories if you're still looking for a laboratory up there in there. But the United States EPA came up with this system of making sure that these contract testing laboratories are qualified to do the jobs. Because frankly, just about any fool can set up a laboratory and they could charge you anything they want. And then you wouldn't know whether they were really good at their job if they weren't accredited. So there's an accreditation process for environmental laboratories here in the United States called the National Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. Uh, and these laboratories get blind samples in about every six months. So if they say they could test E. coli, they get this sample in and they have to be able to test it and report the results back and the sample comes from a third party and they know what was in it because they made it. And so it's certified calibrated standards that you, these laboratories have to test. So it's a very complicated process for these laboratories to get accredited. It takes thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and months of work to get their standards up. So these are the kind of labs that we wanna get uh, we want to use when we're doing our testing. And all of your centers have got multiple labs in the general area around you that you can go to. And they're part of the National Laboratory Accreditation Program. They're NELAP labs. And there's almost as many terminologies in this program as the United States military has. Okay, what kind of methods do they use? Well, the Bible for this kind of thing is called the standard methods for the examination of water and wastewater. And this is the, the you slide here you see, this is the current version uh, that we uh, use in the, uh, and this standard methods is used globally. It is the water and physical properties testing. One of the key tests that are used around the entire world. And there's a whole variety of tests. The book's about three inches thick uh, it makes a great doorstop if you have your windows open in the summer. The, the wind will not blow the door if you're using this book. It's also most, if you're not a laboratory geek, it's among the most boring reading you will ever run encounter in your entire life. Okay, 
So what kind of methods do you want to use? Well, there are standardized methods that we use in water. And, you know, this is the way they're referred to. It's like the, the book is called Standard Methods. Nobody calls it Standard Methods for the Examination of Water and Wastewater. Everybody just says Standard Methods. And so we use Standard Methods. And here are the ones that are utilized. And we have all these. And these are the ones that you would utilize. Uh, Pseudomonas is the one that we would test for primarily, in my professional opinion. If you are testing because you have to test, they may tell you to test something else. They may say heterotrophs and standard total coliform membrane methods. So they may tell you that the number two and the number three I've got down here, the, uh, the 9215D and the 9222, they may tell you you have to test for that. But for us, if you were going to pick one, pick the one at the top. Okay, there's a variety of samples you can just, now, a lot of people think you're doing microbiology on swabs. The only time we really use swabs in microbiology is if you're looking at a specific area, like a shower head or a nozzle or some slime on a drain and you wanna identify what that is. It's like, so these are specific area tests. But for the kind of testing we're talking about for testing water, we use liquid samples. And the standard sample is 100 mils. That's about three ounces, three and, a, three and a third ounces. All right. And when we're doing testing, there, you want to use actual laboratory containers and swabs. They must be sterile because you don't want to be testing something that was on there when you got the container. You want what is from the float water. So you want a sterile container provided by the laboratory. If you are using a neutralizer, if you're using some sort of disinfectant, whether that be chlorine or ozone or hydrogen peroxide, you need to let the laboratory know and they will make sure that there's a little pellet in the bottom of that container. And that pellet is designed to neutralize that disinfectant that you're using in there. But if you're only using UV, you don't have to neutralize that because UV does not persist in the water. All right. One of the keys is if you are required to do testing, according to standard methods, from the time you get that water until the time the lab processes it, it must be six hours or less. Now the book is gonna tell you, you can wait till 24 hours, but if you wait longer than six hours, you have to refrigerate it. So what happens when you get float solution and you refrigerate it? All the salt falls out, right? that messes up the test and now you have an invalid test and the lab won't tell you that until they've run it and given you the bill. So you want to be doing your microbiology test within six hours. All right, what don't you want to use? You don't want to use Q-tips. You don't want to use glass jars because you don't want any glass, right? You don't want a broken glass in your float tank because then you got to drain it and then you got to sort all the glass out. And you don't want to use non-sterile containers. Now, I've been doing swimming pools and spas for 30 years, and I can tell you I have seen some very unusual containers, including pickle jars that still had pickle juice in them. Now, this is not a sample that I got. This is a jar out of my own refrigerator, but I literally have seen pickle jars. I've seen Coke bottles. I've seen used Ziploc bags that were dirty before the sample went in there. And when these samples come in, the laboratory will just throw them away because they're useless. So you get the container from the laboratory, you follow the instructions, 
But one thing you got to do is you got to use a label because they want to know what, late, what the material is, who collected it, when did they collect it, what time did they collect it, is it tank one, is it tank two, is it tank three, is it tank four, is it a fresh water sample that you're checking for pseudomonas. So the more information that you can put on here, the more valuable it will be for you later. The laboratory will give you labels. Use their labels. It's part of the service. They provide containers. They provide labels. And then they will require you to submit these samples using a chain of custody form. Now, you've seen these things. If you ever watched a police show, you know, they've got the little bags and they're writing on the bags and they hand it to the next person on the police show and then they pull out their pen and they write it on there. In that case, the chain of custody is right on the sample container. But for this kind of environmental testing, we have labels on the samples. And then we have a paper document, usually an eight and a half by 11 on there. And that stays with the samples, usually in a big Ziploc bag, and it goes through the entire lab and all the samples are processed it. And it's the chain of custody that tells the lab what you want tested. Because the sample label won't say what you want. It's the chain of custody. And the data on the label has to match the chain of custody, or you're going to get a phone call. Trust me on this. I've gotten more than one phone call doing this. Okay. Okay. And so the chain of custody is a form that looks like this. You have these samples down here, it's sample one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and over here, and they will all look different. Each laboratory is going to have their own. And it's going to say, do you want to test Legion in this form? Legionella. Uh, I can't even read that one. Don't add. That's total plate count, total plate count, anaerobic, that's aerobic, and then there's MICs, and that's a, a minimum inventory concentration testing. So that's a clinical laboratory in there. But the good news is when you get your testing program set up and you go to the lab to get your supplies, the customer service rep is going to show you how to fill this thing out, okay? Because Trust me, the first time you fill it out, you'll get confused and you'll take the samples in and, and then they will help you fill it out again and you'll throw the first form away and everything will be fine. But it's like, but so it's, yes, it's all a pain, but the idea behind it is if you're going to go to the trouble to collect a sample and have it tested, you want to know which sample came from which tank and which test was done on it. So you can go back later and trace that result back to that tank. That's what we're really after. First time it's a pain, after that it's easy. Okay, you're gonna do the testing. What's it mean if you get some bacteria? Don't panic. We are going to find bacteria. There are very, very, very few places outside of an exploding volcano that are sterile. We will find bacteria. So just because you got a few bacteria doesn't mean there's a problem. It's the amount of bacteria and how they're spread and the concentration of the bacteria that mean something. And chances are the bacteria, if you've got your salt level high and somebody finds a pseudomonas or two, that doesn't mean anything. It just means that we're actually testing and we're finding things. I can find bacteria in every one of my swimming pools that many people would be concerned about. I'm not concerned at all about it because I understand these risks. All right. So if there is a level of bacteria, a high level of bacteria, frequently you go back in and you test immediately 
say if you test today, you'll get the result in 48 hours from now. So today's Tuesday, you sample and get it to the lab. They would give the results on Thursday. They might call you and say, hey, tank two had a high level of heterotrophs. You might consider testing it again. You cut another sample, you take it back in, and 95% of the time you're going to find there was no bacteria in there that was a sampling mistake or a sampling issue somewhere along the lines. Like somebody slipped and their thumb went inside the jar when they were pulling a sample. Happens all the time. That's why we do resampling. Okay, now how often for routine sampling should you do? Now, this is the procedure that Float On out there in Portland, uh, Oregon recommends. And uh, Ashcon uh, gave me this slide on here. He suggests that when you're first doing it, you test once per week per tank. And then in second month, you test every other week. And then third through sixth month, you test one tank per month. And then after that, you test one tank per month. And why do you do a whole bunch of testing up front? You want to establish what your normal baseline is in a clean startup. So if you know that tank one always has 25 bacteria per 100 mils, that's not a lot. For swimming pools, the maximum per 100 mils is something like 10,000. So if you're getting 25 and every week you're getting 25, then you've got a baseline. But then you, six months or eight months down the line, you test this tank and it's got 780. You went from 25 to 780. Now you start thinking, Maybe my filter's clogged or something, or maybe something. So then you can start looking. So this is the procedure that uh, Ashcon recommend, and I don't have a better one. So there's some good points and there's some bad points of this. It develops a large database initially. It shows a health department that you're dedicated to it. And after you get going, it minimizes your cost. The bad point is you're focusing on early startup conditions. But what you want to do is if you're going to do a testing program, you want to lay it out in advance. So if you change it all of a sudden, the health department walks in and says, why did you change your testing program? Because you planned to change it, not because you suddenly were getting bad results. All right, how do we make float tank standards better and more rational? We base it on science. We've got a risk assessment. We have that. So we've got some science behind it and the CDC has unofficially agreed. But we need to confirm the original theory that I've got that pathogens are not an issue in float tanks. We use standard test methods. And then the idea behind recruiting your help for this is we're going to publish those results in a scientific journal. So what we're asking is that if you got test results or you would like to help on this, share the data with me. I will not, we'll get some other information coming up here in a minute and it will, we will not list your company's name or your location. They'll be listed like float center A or B or C or D. And D won't stand for Delaware and M won't stand for Maine. No. So it'll be randomly assigned and we're gonna publish this in a scientific paper. And then when the health departments come in and they're gonna say, we think you have a health problem and we're going to pull out the paper and we're going to say, nah, 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 nah. No, we don't because we've got the science. 
And yes, I am willing to stand in front of a health department and go, nah, 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 nah. No, we don't. Here's the paper. Okay. So this is what the FTA Microbiology Project is about. If you've got data, if you're planning on doing data, if you would like to help on the project, we get together, you do a little bit of testing. You don't have to do everything. If you provide some, we have data. No one center gets a huge bill. If we collect data from multiple centers, we get hundreds or thousands of samples. And I think with some of the data I've already got that's been shared with me prior to this, I think we have several hundred samples now. And we have several places that are promising to send data in. We're approaching several thousand samples. The data will be published in a scientific journal. Now, we will share that with the CDC state and county health departments. And the long-term plan is to share it with the National Environmental Health Association. And this is probably the most dynamic organization of health inspectors in the United States. But we've got another one up in Canada. And if we have interest up there, we can uh, publish it up there through uh, Canadian Institutes of Public Health Inspectors in Canada. All right, and from this, we will be able to validate our operating guideline for the international community. Now, how do you help? You've got data. Here's my email address. Uh, if you uh, don't have this written down, you can also just send it, uh, send something uh, into Roy, what's your address to info at uh, uh, fta.org and all of us get that and then I'll get back to you on that. So it's in, info at flotation.org. Oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Patriot loser. All right. So through the same email that you've got the announcement on this, and you can send it back in. It's, it's roy.d.vor at gmail.com on here. All right. Now, I'm not going to be doing this alone. Uh, if you've ever been to FloatCon in the last couple of years, you've seen Flux, right? Everybody seen Flux talk? You've been to FloatCon? Uh, she's at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, she is very well known uh, in the pool and spa industry, just like I am. She's a former health inspector. She's a full professor now up there and uh, uh, works with me on the uh, uh, Pool and Hot Tub Association Education Committee up there. So the three of us are going to be the authors of this. Uh, we're not going to disclose the names of your centers. Like uh, you see down here, we're going to call you A, B, C, D, whatever. In here. The three of us are not going to get paid for it. We're donating our time. Now, once you've got all the information into us, and it can dribble in over the next year. So there's no emergency on doing anything now. But if you start doing a sample here or a sample there or a sample there, we will eventually share the, uh, all the information in here and have enough to publish it. Now, the Float Tank Association is going to pay for the publication. Hopefully, it'll be only about three to four thousand dollars because we actually have to pay to put something in a scientific journal. The subscription costs do not pay for the publication; it pays for the membership. So it'll be a couple of thousand dollars. It won't be as much as fifteen thousand, but if James decides we're going to publish it. And Applied in environmental microbiology because James is an expert. In, no, he's not an expert in microbiology. No. Anyway, anyway, but anyway, so where we publish it, we're going to get it into the best quality journal we can at the most economical course. So if you're a member, you're already helping support this through your membership cost. Uh, if you've got data, if you want to help provide data, send me the data. If you are not a member yet, 
you can join for a minimal cost and that will help defer that because eventually this will be a public domain article. That means it benefits everybody running a float tank in the entire world. So this is a global effort. And we've got a few members down in Australia that have data that are beginning to share. And we've got some in Europe that are starting to share. So it will be a global effort. Okay. This is the last slide, and then I'm going to stop sharing because it's like by now you tired of listening to me babble on. And so this is a document that will be published on the website. And if you really get motivated, you can send me an email tonight and I'll email you this directly on here. This kind of gives you the background of what we talked about on here, uh, how to find a laboratory, uh, how to talk to the laboratory, the kinds of tests that you might want to do and how to collect a sample and how to fill it out. So it's a general guideline uh, uh, on there. Yeah. Yeah, I am going to stop sharing at this point. And, and so it's like, that's what the microbiology, the FTA microbiology project is about, is the recruiting help, recruiting your help. We don't ask you to do every test on every tank do what you feel comfortable with. And the tests are going to cost anywhere from $25 to $60, depending on the laboratory. So don't break your bank thinking that you're the only one doing this. Okay. Uh, Roy, I had a question um, actually that came from Facebook. Um, Laura Allman asked, can you explain pink scum and does regular filtration ozone gas UV light in a one micron bag filter keep that scum low? I scrub walls with peroxide. All of names of different bacteria worry me. Is, should she be worried about anything? <clears throat> uh, generally, the uh, the pink bacteria. Uh, I don't know of any of the pink bacteria except maybe one that would cause human disease. And that particular kind of pink bacteria would not grow in this kind of salt solution. So these are the, the pink things that we're seeing growing in here are very specialized environmental bacteria that do not cause uh, human health hack. They're just a visual nuisance on here. And frankly, probably the easiest way to get rid of them, they're actually a biofilm problem. So take some sort of uh, wipe uh, and wipe the surface with it. And even a, a, a disinfecting wipe, like a bathroom or a kitchen wipe, if you wipe them down very carefully with that, periodically, that will at least reduce them visually to the point that they are not a, 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 an ob obvious nuisance, that, that they're, if anybody ate a salad in the last 24 hours, you probably consumed a thousand times more bacteria than is in your float tank right now. What about the sushi I had for dinner last night? How's sushi? I've never known a microbiologist that would voluntarily, while sober, eat sushi. But that's a different story. <laughs> yeah, and who's sharing? Somebody's sharing in here. That's John. John Rowe. Okay. Yeah. This is an example of a laboratory result that you get back up in here. And this is a very formal uh, uh, result up here. You've got a sample number, a sample ID. It, it's the date on here. You can see pseudomonas, negative. Oh, great. We didn't find any pseudomonas. All right. You know, standard plate count, less than one. That means there was no heterotrophic bacteria in there. All right. There was 
a hundred thousand times more bacteria on my salad tonight than is in John's float tank. So I see John laughing over here. So it's just like, so these are the kind of results. This is the kind of thing that you get back. And frankly, this is written in jargon. So CFU on here, you'll see the term CFU per mil in the middle of the page. It's colony forming units per mil. Fancy name for how many bacteria did you find? Mm -hmm. So, this is the kind of uh, information that microbiologists provide on here. Uh, so thank you for sharing, John. So this is the kind of result you're going to get back uh, from there. Obviously, John had three tests in the first sample and three tests on the second sample and then three tests on the third sample. So what do you do, test three tanks? Hey, Roy, before John takes that down, would you, um, would you just go through the different... Um uh terms and some of those other letters that the rest of us might not understand and, and just tell us uh real briefly what what we can okay. gather from this all right if you look at the uh we start over here uh on the the first group up here at the top says parameter uh, you have down there it's called pseudomonas standard plate count and total coliform so they ran three separate tests on here and these are, by the way, the top three tests that I had on my slide. Okay, so Pseudomonas is, the, is a particular kind of bacteria called Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and that causes skin rashes in swimming pools. It's also the leading cause of earaches among kids in the summer. And the results say negative, and they have an abbreviation for uh, their type of test. It looks like that's a rapid test called a BART test in there. So I'd have to, there will be another page on the result that will give the def, uh, give some more detail on there. So this is a, one of their types of test. The next line below that is standard plate count. It's also called a heterotrophic plate count. The result less than one. In biology, there is no such thing as zero. So this is about as close to zero as you're gonna get. The unit is colony forming units per mil. Level uh, limit of detection is one. That means what is the smallest they can detect is one. Limit of quantitation, that is what is the smallest unit they can reliably measure. That's the limit of quantitation. It looks like uh, DIL is dilution. In case something comes in that looks like that pickle juice jar, they have to dilute it to test it. Then it says SM9215B, that is standard methods 9215B. And that is the date it was analyzed. Uh, April 23rd, 2019. And if you look up here on the top, it says sample date. So the sample date and the sample analyzed, it was analyzed on the same day that the sample was collected. They don't have the number of hours it took on here, but they were done in the same day, which normally means it's done within a six hour limit. All right, and then the next test down there says total coliform. Coliform is a type of bacteria. Uh, it's a very common type of bacteria or the word coliform means colon form. So it's a type of bacteria that might be coming from our colon. So if you had a lot of coliform bacteria in your spa, that might have mean somebody had a fecal accident in your spa, in your float tank, excuse me. I'm still in the pool and spa industry here some days, guys. All right, so they didn't find any coliform bacteria. That means nobody took a crap in John's float tank, which is a good thing. Now, John, He's got his camera off right now because otherwise he didn't want to be laughing and being on camera when I said nobody took a crap in his float tank. So, all right. And so, so 
Oh, go ahead, Roy. And so the test method they used in here is standard method uh, SM 9223. And so to a trained microbiologist, this is a very well-written report. And to somebody who doesn't do this for a living, it's a bunch of gobbledygook on a page that costs you a bunch of money. Go ahead, John. So I just wanna give some context to this. I know this is an older report. I have my float tanks uh, tested through Badger Laboratories every four months. This was just one that was literally right there for me to pick out. But this is exactly what the report shows. And I just added a fourth tank every single time. I feel like I'm spending money for them to give me the exact same results every single time. And I think that that goes to the point of the microbiology pro uh, project. So, so Roy, I wanted you to give an answer about this document. Would this be useful for your collection process if I share? This that? is exactly what I am looking for. And so I also wanted to show too that this is also the chain of custody, I think that you were mentioning. Um, I know this is kind of sloppy, but this I this is what they want me to fill out. So uh, I, I put my name, my terrible handwriting, when I took the sample, what time, and then when it was received. And for anybody that's out there that's like, well, I want to I want to contribute, but I feel like it's going to be a lot of time. These laboratories actually provide transportation services. At least that's what mine does. So they'll actually yeah. bring me in, in what Roy was mentioning before. I'll stop sharing uh, here, but um, what Roy was mentioning before was, is that in the vial, you actually have this vial that they give you and uh, inside the vial, you, you, it's got a seal that if you break that seal, the vial is invalid. You only break the seal when you're ready to test it. You wear gloves and it has a little pill inside of it. That little pill I think is to neutralize. It's got this like little, you could shake it and it like, you know, but, but, and then they say to fill it and they usually have you take three samples of three of those little vials per unit. And that's because they wanna verify those checks. And that's how, and then the guy will come, they give you a cooler, the guy will come and he'll pick it up and then he'll drop you off a replacement for the next time. Cause I think it's worth for them to give you all the supplies so that they can continue that process. They want you to, they wanna they want to charge you just like any other business. So it's actually they, quite simple. What they normally do is they really have an ice chest. You know, they bring you a, a little ice chest that's got the little sample containers in it. It's got a, a, a Ziploc bag that's got labels in it. It's got a, the, the chain of custody in it. So they just drop it on your front desk in there and you have your samples ready to go. They pick up the other one and they walk out the door with it. So you don't even have, it's like most of them are like that. Now, uh, I'm on the more industrial side. So it's like, I'm doing just in time sampling sometimes. So I'm driving it to my lab, but my lab's 15 minutes away. So it's, it's not a big deal here in here. But uh, you see the, these are many of the same labs or slightly different labs that you see these at doctor's offices, they drive around and they pick up samples. So it's the same kind of business. They're a service provider their goal is to make it incredibly easy for you. And they usually have a dedicated customer service rep that you got a question, I don't know what kind of testing I want. And you talk to them on Minute Bennett and you use the information that I'll give you and they'll tell you, okay, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this, we can't do this, we can't do this, we can't do this. So it's really simple. Now, what John just also pointed out is he's getting the same result over and over and over again, which means he should reduce his frequency of testing to save money because now he's got a baseline. And so and the reason he, they get three bottles of each test, because each one takes 100 mils. And those bottles frequently are about 100 mils. So it's like, so if you want pseudomonas, uh, heterotrophic plate count, and total coliform, you're going to have three bottles. And they're going to use a different bottle for each one.
Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Okay. So my tests, uh, I've been running tests, but I did not send them because uh, I can tell you that it's not been within six hours. I ship mine. They send me a thing. They do all the, the same stuff you talked about, but I mail it overnight. So it's definitely not happening within six hours. Okay. And I don't know that it's accredited on that list. I have to double check, but so I didn't send it. Right. Now, that's not necessarily bad. Now, for maximum confidence, we want that six hour test. No microbiologist on the planet ever said that there was a difference in result between six hours and 20 hours in a float tank. Frankly, you're not going to find too many bacteria anyway. So we would look the best quality data we've got. But, Marie, go ahead and send, you know, do whatever you got. Because we'll look at the result, and I'll get back with you, and maybe we'll have two categories. We'll have accredited data and non-accredited data on here, because we can still do a trend line. And the trend line is more important than being 100% kosher on every T and I and, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean I we're going to lose a comma out of one sentence and put a semicolon in another one. And it's like, no, it's like we have to start somewhere. We've got very little data now. We've got a high degree of confidence. But anything that you've got, anything that you can share, we'll compile and it'll be better than where we are today. Thanks, Roy. So anybody out there, um, if you're interested in contributing, I think that it's worthwhile just looking up local uh, local water testing facility or or lab, local laboratory, and then just reaching out to them. Uh, because what Roy pointed out, like they they literally do, they like donate a uh, a cooler <laughs> to you with the with the samples, and they keep they pick them up and then they bring you new ones. So like if I should be reducing the frequency. So the Roy, the reason I do the frequency is because I actually put that very proudly on the wall, despite not knowing what it actually meant. <laughs> All I could say was, is that they told me that this stuff is cleaner than what comes out of a tap water faucet. That's what they said. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, and so I, that's what All I right. tell my guests. I'm like, yeah, the water's cleaner than what comes out of the faucet. This, so you got nothing is, to worry about. This is tap water. I'm drinking it. Your float tank has less bacteria in it than the tap water that I'm drinking right now. Wow. What a seriously awesome statement. Like, I think that that's great. Like, we got nothing to worry about, friends. <laughs> well, we do. We still got to maintain our sanitation, our chemistry. We have to maintain our sanitation. And it's like, so it's like, so. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any questions out there? I have a quick question. Um, Roy. You don't drink filtered water. You actually drink tap water. Yeah. <laughs> I would I, rather I would rather drink tap water than an IPA. I'm shocked. Shocked. If you do a risk assessment. What is the highest risk factor that you're likely to do in the next 24 hours? Drive a car. Drive a car. Yeah. Okay. What is the risk of tap water using a validated potable water system, public potable water system in the United States. Very small, very small. I don't know. 
I have zero facts to back it up, but I feel like public water is just no good. Put it this way. That public water provider that all of you are using, and this goes for all of our friends uh, up there north of the border, that public water provider is doing more frequent water testing than everybody in the float industry combined. And that is one provider that is testing everything more seriously than all of us put together because they have to be a certified laboratory. They have to have trained technicians. These are the same tests that these contract labs do. And by the way, they have the same standard methods for the examination of water and wastewater. And I just also happen to live in a county with nearly a million people in it that just built an $85 million water treatment plant. Right. But is the rub. Yeah, right. But when I lived in Delaware for our friends up in Glasgow, not too far from where I used to have an apartment, they had very good water. And I'll put money on the fact that everybody on here, if you're on public water, has got pretty good quality water in the United States. Now, I used to go to England all the time. I drank beer when I was in England. I don't know what they call that water over there, but it was, I wasn't going to touch that stuff. I have a question for you, Roy. Um, when should we do the test? You know, if we, you know, we put, uh, we use peroxide mm -hmm. and we put it twice a day. And for one bath, for some reason, we have to put it three times a day to make sure we're always at a good level. So when should we do the testing to be, to be, to make sure that we know if everything is okay? So you have a question about how good your system is. So one way to do it. No, is... no, no, no. My question is when should we do the testing? When should we? If you, if you get a water sample before you add peroxide of a morning, and then the next time you test, you test after you add the peroxide. And so you, Test one time this way and the next time this way, and then you go back and test the other direction. And now you've got a series of tests before and after. And after a couple of rounds, you'll know whether you have any bacteria at all, and you'll find out that you are using your peroxide not to kill bacteria, but to oxidize organics in there. And so I'll put money on the fact you don't have very many bacteria in there, but your peroxide is keeping the water cleaner. It's not killing, but it's oxidizing. Okay, good. And what about, tur I don't know if it's a word in English, turbidity? Turbidity, turbidity. yeah. Mm -hmm. Should we test for that or? You could test for that. Now, um, uh, the more important thing is probably, if we're doing microbiology, the more important thing is to measure your salt concentration. Wow. We yeah. did that. OK. Yeah. And so all of you are measuring your salt concentration anyway, right? Of course. Because yeah. You, yeah, you've got to be adding your, you've got to know when to add salt back. Yeah. So if you're doing some microbiology, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're doing a microbiology test, say Tuesday, measure your salt on Tuesday. And so then you've got a record and you don't have to send that out. You can test that yourself because the lab will try to do some complicated test on what your salt concentration is and they'll come and they'll blow it because they're not going to have the right equipment to do it like all of you guys have got. I mean, it's like, you do that one routinely. You know how to do it. 
don't waste the money on sending that one out. Okay. Thank you. Well, I have a question um, based on, on the question we just heard. Um, what would be some of the common causes if you had uh, a float tank that seemed to be eating up the peroxide so much quicker than other tanks? Because I've definitely heard a lot of people talk about that, and I've experienced it myself, where even if you're putting consistent across the same type of float tank that's getting pretty similar use, um, but yeah, one of them will just be burning through the peroxide. Do you have any uh, first thoughts on that? The, the, typical, the typical cause of loss of peroxide is bacteria. Now, it's not the bacteria in the water, but you could have a biofilm built up somewhere, a slime layer. And it's very difficult in a float tank because, you know, I mean, it's already slick. And the way you typically find biofilm is it's slick. So you have to look for something that has a little different color on there. And it's usually around a nook or a cranny or somewhere, or maybe depending on the kind of filter you're using, if you're using a cartridge filter, maybe your cartridge filter or your housing is contaminated. Because now if you use, all of us have probably used 3% peroxide, you know, to, you know, you get a cut or something. So you use a 3% solution of peroxide, you dribble it on your skin and it bubbles up in there. And it's like, what's bubbling up is if that's a reaction between the enzymes in our skin, that's breaking the peroxide down. The bacteria have that same enzyme called catalase in there. So if you are losing peroxide consistently in one tank, you almost certainly have some sort of biofilm buildup somewhere. And also, finding it may be a chore. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned uh, cartridge filters. Um, uh, even with float tanks that use bag filters, sometimes the filter uh, bag housing that you stuff your filter bag into, if you remove that, there could be, uh, I've, I've Absolutely. definitely had buildup uh, in that area. So. Absolutely. So it, it could be building up anywhere. I mean, a biofilm is a film that sticks to a surface. And it could be any, I mean, we have biofilms on our eyeballs. So virtually any surface that is wet for 15 minutes is going to develop some biofilm. So it's really the amount of biofilm that's in there. So, I mean, what you've got is you've got one that's got more biofilm in it than another one. Okay. Um, in something else that we had talked about being one of the purposes of these regular microbiology calls uh, is for the community to come together to establish best practices um, for our industry and for our community. And with regard to, um, you know, since it's clear that some of us do have that problem uh, from time to time, is there a protocol that you would recommend as far as getting rid of or um you know flushing out the system um i i'll tell you what i do um which you know as as we've all talked about before on these type of calls it's a uh, it's a little humbling telling people you know what you do and and not knowing for sure is this the best practice or not um so what we've done is uh annually we drain our tanks um, we clean them out as best we can first with just hot water. We drain them again, and then we fill them with water and either a spa purge product or, uh, just bleach. And then we run it overnight. Uh, and then just to, to keep the, the water and bleach or water and spa purge moving through the filtration system. And the following day, uh, drain it again fill it again to flush it out and get all the bleach in and everything else that's out of there, or at least dilute it as, as best we can, and then refill it again. So all in all, it ends up being four or five float tanks worth of water. 
do you think that that's a, a good starting point? Um, you know, much like Jonathan, anytime we've tested our water, it comes back uh, with those same exact results over and over again. So yeah. we feel like what we're doing is working. Um, does it seem like a quality method to you? Yeah. What I can tell you is when you're doing that, that annual drain and refill, <coughs> excuse me, you're probably better off using one of those spa purge products than a bleach product. Because if you're using a bleach, what it really does is it just oxidizes the top layer of the biofilm and it doesn't penetrate to the bottom of it. Uh, the spa purges are really alkaline surfactants. They're, they're, they're a soap type thing. They're a detergent type thing. And so they will dissolve it right to the plastic surface and then solubilize it. And so when you drain it, that gets out of it. And so the type of procedure you're using is commonly used in commercial spas where they do that. So we've got some procedures from the spa industry that I think we can bring over in here. Uh, but uh, as you point out, one of the purposes of, of this uh, I think we're going to doing these quarterly for micro talks just to bring up topics like this. We don't have best practices yet. I mean, because we finally just found somebody with a micro brain to get involved in this kind of stuff. You know, uh, so it's like, I think we can take some, uh, collective experience like you're you're talking about i know greg's got experience up in wisconsin doing the same thing i think drew's talked about it jonathan's talked about it so i think sharing some of these stories we can develop best practices as we go forward over the next year uh two years so so i wanted to just mention my, my procedure is very similar to yours james except for i man you really take it to the extreme uh, we we do a complete fill and I kind of feel a little bit like a fool now because I have only used bleach in that, uh, in that interim cleaning before then draining that and refilling. So I'm hoping that San and Reg, and I'm sure that's what we're here for. Um, if you guys, if we can come up with a spa purge product, that's like an industry standard that we can put out to, you know, the industry that says this is probably one of the better products or here's a list of products because I don't even really know the first thing about spa purge products. Can anyone speak to that or, or maybe that's something we can talk about in the future? Uh, frankly, it's like uh, uh, spa purges are not a regulated product, which means they're not EPA approved. And so they're about like a health food. You can make just about any claim you want on them and nobody's gonna slap your wrist for lying. Uh, so uh, I have been around them, but I think that it's uh, for this is a unique application. I think we're gonna have to compare notes on who has found which products work because because they're coming out of the pool and spa industry, I will tell you some of them are less useful than snake oil. So James, do you have a specific suggestion that you'd be okay with sharing or do you want to? Don't really have one that uh, I think is any better than any other. Um, I usually just grab something from the local uh, pool and hot tub store. Um, yeah. And nothing's stood out as great or terrible. Um, I really like BioGuard uh, brand stuff is what I almost always go with as far as uh, pH increasers and decreasers and alkalinity increaser. Um, but that's really about it. Right on. So it sounds like maybe this is more work that we could potentially look into in the future is trying to find that, you know, best best class products, you know, potentially for pool and spa regular or uh, for sanitation regulation. So. Hey guys, if I may, I just added a link into the chat of the one that um, the owner of the wave cabin that I have, I have always used the spa purge and it's that product that I just added to the chat. 
I don't know if it's good or not, especially after what Roy just said, but that's what I was told to use when I did my first um, drain and cleaning. Um, so hopefully it's a good one, but that's what I've been using. And I do that once a year, same I've way. definitely used that that same product before as well. And uh, yeah, no adverse reactions for sure. Right on. Natural chemistry is something that I've used all the time, actually, for all my alkalinity increasers, decreases for pH. So awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Drew. I really appreciate it. No doubt. Anybody else? Well, have um, <laughs> anyway, I, I was typing an answer back, a private question I got in here. It's like, I won't say who put it in there, but somebody said, uh, what about old data? Well, old data, new data, data is data. It, it's like, if you've got data, share it. I mean, you collected it the best way you could. I'm trying to give you the best way you're supposed to do it. But it's frankly, we all learn or theoretically we all learn as we go through these things. Uh, it's like some of us learn slowly. I'm talking about myself, not James. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to try not to get James too mad because you know, <laughs> James is going to be the host center for the float conference 2022, you know, so we're all going to Portland, Oregon, you know, Port I mean, Portland, Portland Maine. Maine. Go Portland, on. Maine. I blow it. I blow it. <laughs> so we're all going to Portland, Maine. So our friends up in Canada, you don't have to go that far because, you know, I mean, Maine's just right down there. It's just going. Like, we're, you know. we're pretty much just like Southern Maine, uh, Southern uh, Canada, really. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. We can't wait to, can't well, wait. You to guys go. both have those strange looking cows up there, whatever they are. It's like, you know. <laughs> I don't have any idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I think you call them moose. Oh, moose. Uh, yeah, our moose, uh, our moose population is not as what it was when I was a kid. I can tell you that. But, uh, Roy, I had another question before we go start and talking about moose and other silly things. <laughs> um, I've, I've talked to some people in the past, and we've discussed how – confident can we be with the accuracy of the tests given that it's being used on uh, a solution like we have um what i've what i've always kind it's of figured not, it's a it's a really good question i've had a conversation with that uh the chief microbiologist at the cdc for recreational water was sitting in row three when ashcon and i presented the uh, assessment uh, at World Aquatic Health Conference. And then Ashcon, Graham and I uh, sent down with uh, uh, Van Sill and proceeded to have a few beverages. Uh, so we had conversations about that on there. It's like, there are no tests that are optimized for float tanks. So we're using water tests, but they are the best ones that we've got. Now we would, if we really wanted to develop tests, we could probably do it. It might, we might be able to get it done in 15 or 20 years. And I'm not exaggerating. So we're going to use the best methodology that we've got. And it's the methodology that the health departments are going to recognize and that the contract labs can do today. So rather than go out and try to create optimal conditions we're getting the best we can get it's not going to be perfect but it's in substantially close to being reliable we're not likely to miss much of the pathogens at least there's bacteria in there that we're probably not testing for, but then as a professional microbiologist, we probably only know about 5% of the real bacteria in the world anyway. So we're not testing for everything anyway. So Roy, we had a question that came in through Facebook from Laura Ellman. She said, it's my understanding that the magnesium is a natural antimicrobial does the magnesium naturally keep bacteria low? 
depends on the concentration. That's actually an excellent question down there. And it, it, depending on the concentration, many organisms will, many microbes will not be able to grow. But things like fungi and certain kinds of yeast will be able to grow. So we should not never be saying that due to the salt level, the solution is sterile. We should say the magnesium is a substantial inhibitor of growth, particularly of those that are known to cause disease. So we need to couch our terms very carefully in there. Never say it's sterile. Never use the word safe. Biology is a, a, a field of statistics. In biology, you never use the word never. Another, I think, good question. Um, is it necessary to drain your water at any particular frequency? Do you have anything to, you know, maybe add to that? Well, I know a couple of crazy guys out in Portland, Oregon, that have had a couple of float tanks that they said they've used the same water in for several years. And their float tanks are running about 90% capacity, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we do not know what the frequency should be to replace the water. I'll add something to that. Considering uh, the notion of totally dissolved solids, um, it's impossible to know what the actual TDS is because, I mean, obviously we have a totally dissolved solid of Epsom salt in the water, but what about byproducts of other types of chemicals in the water? Yeah, that's really the problem. It's like if we wanted, when we're measuring the specific gravity, because that's what we're really measuring, you know, I mean, most of us are using hydrometers or something on measuring the specific gravity for salt. You're measuring all the salts that are in there, not just magnesium sulfate. It's the, the, the sodium chloride, excuse me, coming out of the sweat. Uh, it, it's uh, the hardness reagents. It, it's like you know, all of the material that's in there all is measured as TDS. So we don't know exactly what the concentration, we could spend a whole lot of money to do it. But then if we look back at the history of it, we do not see a lot, we see what one or two outbreaks of bacterial diseases in float tanks. And that last one was a year or two ago out in Vancouver. Uh, if you've seen the pictures of it, the tank was green when the guy got in it and he reported that the density of water was so low he was sitting on the bottom, which means it didn't have enough salt in it. And so there's one or two other stories that go along with that. So when we look at the history of it and we look at and we compare that to the known microbiology of human pathogens, I'm not sure we need to spend a lot of effort figuring out whether it's TDS or the specific gravity that we should go by. Frankly, you know, when, when I had that conversation, there at the World Aquatic Health Conference, we had close to 100 public health officials in that room. And I looked right at them and said, I can't figure out what the real pathogens are going to be in float tanks based upon what we know in pools and spas. And nobody in that room could come up with one that they were really concerned about based upon what we're doing and the way we are exposed to it. It's not to say the cryptosporidium isn't in the tank, but you're not swallowing float water.
excellent. Thank you for answering that question. And uh, anybody else out there that have any questions before we sum everything up, I do have a quick announcement of an upcoming roundtable uh, that I'd like to mention. But at first, well, let's get some questions answered. Can I make a statement real fast? Sure, Jesse. Hey, I just wanted to say, you know, we were talking about changing out water. Um, I have five tanks in my location. And I would say four of them have never had their water changed. Um, one of them had chemistry got out of control. We couldn't get it. But I would say our water is always getting changed out through evaporation, through people. We are always adding water. We're never taking water out of our tanks. We're always adding water. And as long as you maintain your chemistry, we use UV light, uh, Washington in the county we're in does not allow any chemical additions for sanitation. So we use UV and we use a 50% hydrogen peroxide solution that we maintain at 100 parts per million. And we test that daily. Uh, we've never had any issues with our tanks. Uh, our health department comes in and takes water samples quarterly. And we uh, do semi-annually. We use the same lab as the health department for the testing. Um, and we've never had any issues with our water. So I would say as long as you're maintaining your chemistry, you're changing out your filters, keeping your filters clean, you can almost run indefinitely with never changing, like officially draining completely and refilling um, because you're always refilling your tanks and you're always adding salt and you're always adding water. Um, I would say that's almost like just an extra cost that if you're doing that, you're taking that on. I don't know if there's a real benefit there. And I don't know what your comment or, or thoughts are on that, Roy, but that's kind of my opinion. And it's been three years for us, um, yeah. and I've had no issues. You know, we continually test total coloform and heterotrophic plate counts, and we're typically in the non-detectable to yeah. very low below, num you know, numbers where we have to take any action. Yeah, Bernard. Yeah, uh, Bernard you're on mute. Well, uh, Jesse, I have to uh, confirm you. I've been using, I've been in flotation tanks since 1982, and uh, I have six tanks now. And uh, well, it may be happened in 39 years once that I had to throw away the water completely of a tank. And it was because, you know, there was some, I don't remember the problem. So I never had to throw away the water of a tank for the specific reason that you said. Yeah, so it, it, I'm, I'm agreeing with you guys. It, it's like already, you know, from a total outside, when I did that risk assessment back in 2018, I'm coming in totally from an outside viewpoint, coming in as a skeptic. And I'm working through every mathematical model that I could figure out. I mean, it's like I've written the most advanced discussion on recreational water illnesses in pools and spas that's been published. I mean, I am the dude in pools and spas on diseases. And I'm looking over here at float tanks and I spent like three months scratching my head trying to figure out how to get sick in a float tank if you're running it well, and I can't figure out how to do it. But like we've talked about on the slides, our opinions and our limited knowledge doesn't carry the weight with every float department. But I mean, Jesse, you've got data. I mean, so we've all got a little bit of data. We all share that data. Now we publish that data. Now we can stick it in somebody's face and say, no state of Florida, we do not need to put chlorine in the float tank in the state of Florida because they require it. By the way, they can't measure it. They damn well know it because the state of Florida paid for the test that said they couldn't prove there was chlorine by the test. But they still require chlorine. So my whole interest in this is trying to prevent some of the stupidity that I have dealt with in pools and spas since 1991 from coming into a rather unique industry because that's where I'm coming from. It's like, let's do this rationally and not do some of the stupid mistakes that I've had to live through in pools and spas. That's my true motivation. 
Yeah, and Roy, I, you know, I, the, my health department forwards their data to me um, every time they test, and uh, because we use the same lab, yeah. so I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll forward all that data to you. Well, and, you're out there. Uh, in, you're out there in Washington State, and it was like uh, your your state director before he retired. It was Gary Frazier, up yep. there, who's a good friend of mine, who's a fellow uh, instru instructor trainer of mine. So I worked with Gary for years. I think when float tanks first came in there, Gary got a hold of me years ago, and so I've talked to. Uh, I mean, so the the state of Washington is a rational example. Of public health. That yeah, it varies county to county. Like some counties have don't do anything. I unfortunately am in the county that says, tell us how you're meeting all the pool regs. <laughs> and so it took me a very long time to get open and deal with those guys. And, and this uh, is a perfect example. It's the way we rationalize the county regulations is we get this data and compile it in the scientific paper. And then I call up Gary and say, Gary, I'm going to send you a PDF. And then Gary's going to take the PDF of the article that we write because he's the one that trains the county health inspectors. So we use the connections from the pool and spa industry that I know to take the data back and train the county health departments in what the science should be. It's actually a very small world out there. It's actually a very small world out in there with just a few phone calls. Most of us can reach just about any county health department in the country. Roy, right. oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I just have a really crazy quick question. Would it help in the assimilation of the data if you knew how each of us was sanitizing? Does that matter? Yeah, uh, as we get into it, I'll, I'll get back to you and then okay. we'll compile that data in there. And it's like, frankly, at this point, uh, what I've learned is not to make a whole lot of preconceived ideas about how this is going to go, because it's going to take so many left-hand blind turns and, and I'm going to be so confused that I am going to ac accidentally cheer for the Patriots at some time in the next football season. Yeah. So, so it's like, so we're going to get through this. It's going to be a collaborative effort. And then, you know, we'll keep doing these quarterly things and you guys are going to keep asking questions that I haven't thought of yet. And, and we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. And we'll try not to be too sane in the process. That's my promise to you. So, so, so to start this out, uh, sanitation regulation, the microbiology project, where can we send the data? Do we have that set up yet? Do we have anything going? It, uh, to uh, make sure that the idea is we do not want you to necessarily expose any data from your lab outside of your operation unnecessarily. So we're gonna treat this kind of like we do with public health data. So you email it directly to me and the only people that will actually see the reports will be me and Flux and Laura Supis. And all of us work within public health so we know to maintain confidentiality of your facility. So we blind your data, just like we do in a medical study. And so you will be assigned a letter and your lab will be a letter. And anybody outside of me and Flux and Laura will only know a letter. So email it to me. My address is really complicated. It's Roy dot D dot Vor, V-O-R-E, at Gmail. Got that, James? I just like Look, if James can get it, anybody can get it. Come on. I'll put that in Facebook too. And hopefully uh, anybody who's listening out there in Facebook world or uh, through Zoom, um, we would love for you to contribute to this because 
what's the ultimate goal, Roy? Like we could potentially have published research. Yeah, that's the goal. And, and it's like things that you're already doing, things that you're already interested in doing, you provide it in here. Flux, Laura and I will compile it. We'll get the journal article out. It's good for Flux because it helps him become a, uh, a tenured professor. Laura is already a professor at the University of Wisconsin, so she gets credit for it. And I get to see you and you occasionally buy me a beer when I see you in person and I get paid that way. Okay, how's that for a deal? Not IPAs. Let's make that clear, no IPAs. Wait till you get up here to Portland. Roy, we'll get we'll give you an IPA. It'll be fun though. <laughs> I, I, I can what I can tell you though, it's like one of these times I want to get back to Montreal because the last time I was there, I found this one restaurant that had a hundred local beers. Yeah, and Montreal is a very they cool had, city. They had the glass and the coaster for every local beer. Two nights of trying to stump the beer, uh, the the beer tender. I lost. He stumped me. We're very excited for float for the upcoming uh, 2022 float conference, Portland, Maine. I can't wait to see you, James. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait to see you, Roy. It's going to be one. It's. I'm telling you, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited. It's going to be quite the vacation for me, and I hope to see everybody there. Um, I wanted to. I wanted to ask: Is is Mandy on this? If she is, um, you're welcome to, you know, kind of come in and, and mention um, our upcoming uh, roundtable. This is for I'm members. Here, hey, no. uh, you want to tell us about upcoming roundtable this coming uh, Thursday, January twentieth? This is a member only roundtable, so anybody out there, if you're not a member of the FTA, join because this is going to be one you're not going to want to miss. Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, coming to you live from inside the spa tonight here in Austin. Um, but we have a really amazing coach. She floats on a regular basis and she coaches all of her clients on accomplishing their goals and not always doing it through maybe standard practices, but the magic behind manifestation and helping people really dream big and accomplish their goals. So this is just meant to be for anybody who has a goal, whether it's personal or business related, and you want to really put it down on paper, inspire yourself and your team, get an action plan in place. We're going to do it Thursday. I believe it's at this same time at seven o'clock Eastern, and there'll be a full workshop. So you guys can follow along. You can do it later with your teams if you want, but if you're not a member yet, please sign up and then we'd love to send you the invitation. Absolutely. So yeah, 5, 5 PM, um, central. Uh, I'm sorry. Five. Thank you. Oh, well, you're, you're in a different time zone. So it actually, it's, uh, 5 PM central, 7 PM Eastern. Oh. Wait, no, oh. 6 PM Eastern. Six oh. Eastern. Yeah, 6 Eastern, 5 Central. I get so confused with these things. 4 p.m. Um, what would that be? Well, you know, I'm not going to try 4 yeah, p.m. Yeah, yeah. Mountain, 3 <laughs> p.m. Pacific. I'm going to let Roy do this. He's the scientist. <laughs> Just look, for the, look for the email. Look yeah, yeah, look email. for the email. Look thank, for the email. Thank you, Mandy. We're very excited to be there. Thank you so much, Roy. Man, it. I'm... You know, I got to say, th these, these roundtables, these microbiology roundtables are, are super exciting. Actually, I didn't, I, I thought maybe it'd be a little not as entertaining, but you really know how to entertain a crowd. And I'll tell you, do it in a classy way, my friend. So thank and, you. And, and also, let's keep in mind uh, that this is just going to be the first of many. So, um, you know, over the, over the coming year, just uh, when you have those crazy questions that, you know, only Roy can answer. Uh, jot them down and uh, and catch us for the next one and and you know all two questions zero. are fair. Something like you know what is the weight of an ostrich egg or you know I mean what is the length of an elephant's uh, trunk? You know I mean you know all questions are fair. What's your favorite IPA? <laughs> uh, frozen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, I think that that does it for tonight. We we'll hope to see you all on the 20th for the next upcoming roundtable with Mandy Rowe. And uh, yeah, have a wonderful evening, everybody. Take care. Bye, all. Mm -hmm.
Bye, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you.